Where do old aeroplanes go when the time comes to retire them from the sky? Almost one in ten of them are flown to eCube Solutions in Wales, one of the world's fastest growing facilities for the recycling and stripping out of old aircraft. Whatever the customer wants, we'll take off. Every year, around 60 commercial airliners land at the company's designated airbase, and the lads just can't wait to get their hands on them. All these planes, and you just get to play with the biggest toy set in the world. This squadron of high-vis heroes love to get their hands dirty and fly in the face of whatever problems are thrown at them. Yeah, there's pressure. Um, we cope with it. We thrive on it. They join forces to take these old airliners to pieces so their thousands of mechanical components can be sold on to satisfy the growing global demand for refurbished plane parts. Let's get them off the aircraft. But it's a race against the clock to take these multi-million pound planes to pieces before they reach their final destination, the scrapyard. All these are ready to go now, so we're going to have the demolition boys are going to be coming in and they're going to start smashing them up. Join the lads as they battle hostile weather and get to grips with massive machinery. I see them go down smoother, put it that way. All to meet deadlines set by bullish buyers. Money's time, time's money. And we're not talking peanuts here, we're talking millions. Welcome to the world of the plane reclaimers. So, good job then. Yeah. <laughs> The majority of the planes that touch down at E-Cube end their journeys at the on-site scrapyard. There, the empty shells of their fuselages are torn to pieces by the T-Rex-like jaws of the monster-sized wrecking machines. So this is the funeral parlour for these aircraft. Um, everything uh, of any value to us or the customer has been removed, uh, and it's just tin cans that's left. As a company, we get through a serious amount of tonnage um, every year, and, uh, and now the job is nearly done, and bring on the next wave of aircraft. Before the planes meet this crashing end, they undergo a complete strip-out of any valuable parts that can be refurbished and used on other planes. And that's the fate that awaits the plane that's flying in today. Everyone's at the ready for an Airbus A319. It's en route from the Middle East, but a flight delay means it's running hours behind schedule. And that could be a problem, because the engines on the Airbus have already been bought by another airline that needs them for their own plane. And every hour their plane is engineless and not flying, paying passengers, it's costing them tens of thousands of dollars in lost income. So, the pressure's on for head of operations, Bob. They have high expectations. Once they get off the aircraft, they want everything done immediately. So it's very challenging. Just want to wait here, Phil. Mm -hmm. Bob and wingman Phil will be hoping the force is with them today. Bob with his lifesaver. Indeed, space age was a term used when Airbus designed the A319 during the early 70s. The company envisioned a broad family of futuristic airliners with which to compete against Boeing and Douglas, two established US aerospace manufacturers. By the late 80s, it had succeeded, becoming one of the world's most popular aircraft, with the A320 having an eye-watering price tag of just over $100 million. But every plane that comes off the production line has to make a final flight. And that moment has arrived for this Airbus today. Runway 25, clear to land, surface wind 25, zero degrees, one four knots. And over in the tower, air traffic controller James is in direct communication with her captain. Guiding the plane in, James relays instructions directly to Bob on the runway. With darkness falling, the plane makes a successful touchdown, guided in by Jedi Master Bob. The clock is now ticking to get this plane stripped out and the parts sold on. The first priority is the engines. The lads are already behind schedule because of the flight delay and must now work extra fast to get these multi-million dollar bits of kit off to their awaiting buyer. 
But before the sale can go ahead, Bob is supporting a licensed engineer to test the engines and confirm that they're up to scratch. Request permission to carry out a high-powered engine ground run on an A319. No fire cover um, required. Each engine has got to be checked out to a certain uh, percentage of power before they can sell the engines on. The majority of the reclamation value of a plane okay. sits in its engines, so if they fail the test, it will render the plane effectively worthless. We've got one engine now at full power. The noise is deafening, over 140 decibels, enough to rupture your eardrums. Yeah, too loud, really. <laughs> It's so dangerous around them when they're running like that on the ground. You don't even get anywhere near them. Especially near the intake, it'll just suck you straight in there and uh, ruin your day, really. What we're doing now, we've asked for a printout of the engine parameters. If all be well, they'll print out the results from the uh, onboard computers and they'll go away to the uh, potential buyers then. They need to know whether the engines are still capable of their full power before they sell them. That was good. Very good. There we go, job done. Let's get them off the aircraft. The engines have passed the test with flying colours, but they still need to be removed first thing in the morning to get them to their new owner. But there's still one important job to be done before the lads can shut up shop for the night, and you need a strong stomach for it. When you arrive, what we tend to do is sort of clear the galley if there's any fresh food on it, because if you don't tie that off, you come in two or three weeks later, especially in the summer, and you don't want to be coming in there, then. Oh, look at that, dragon fruit. Best before tomorrow. Oh, jeez. A load of mouldy, horrible food, and the smell is horrendous. As dawn breaks over the airbase, one of E-Cube's owners, Mike Corn, is walking the lot, inspecting the aircraft that are on site for dismantling. But even though all of the planes are at the end of their life, there is one word not to be used in front of Mike. Definitely not a scrapyard. There, um, uh, that, that can be a, an understandable misunderstanding of what we do. These aircraft are disassembled in accordance with all the standard procedures. When the word scrapyard is used, one assumes it's rather agricultural. We've actually coined disassembly as our standard description of what we do, which is a, an accurate description. It is uh, anything but a, a scrapyard. Proving Mike's words ring true, the lads are hard at work on the Airbus that landed last night. The engines are always the first things that get removed and sold on, as they're the most valuable part of an aeroplane. And another airline is waiting to repatriate these engines to their own aircraft. And they've signed a cheque for a whopping $12 million for the privilege. But the late arrival of the plane last night has meant the engines are coming off a day later than anticipated. So the pressure's on to get them shipped to their new owner. The first task before removal is to drain the engines of their oil. But befitting a multi-million pound piece of engineering, that's not as simple as a trip to a garage with a car. Just as well, master technician Khalil is on hand to do the job. The plan this morning is to drain the engines before removal. You never know what's going to happen. Uh, it's always a different engine. This one's a different one to what, I'm, what I usually do. And it's one of the first ones I've done of this type. So let's just hope um, everything goes to plan. Got to find out how to get the oil out first. <laughs> Khalil can usually do this task in his sleep, but his day is turning into a nightmare as he can't locate the sump cap. Usually there's a plug at the bottom of the tank, but this tank doesn't seem to have one. Not to be beaten, help is at hand. I've got this um, app, which kind of shows me for different engines. It's better than having paper. But the app isn't providing the answers. Happening. So Khalil ditches it and goes back to looking for the sump the old-fashioned way. He needs to locate the elusive oil sump fast, or he might get into a spot of bother with That's Sam. Oil pump. It's oil scavenge. It's that. The engine oil needs to be drained so that the new owner can replace it with their own certified fluid. But Khalil is still struggling, and Sam's onto him. I don't know what uh, Khalil's doing over there. He's, um, he's messing about with the engine oil. 
Uh, he, needs to get, he needs to get a bit of a wiggle on, really, because we've got uh, customers waiting for these engines to come off. So uh, we'll have to go and kick him up the bum in a minute. But just as Sam rocks up, Khalil finds the sump. Hurrah! Sam does know his stuff, and even when I get stuck or I'm in trouble with something, I just go ask Sam and he, he'll help me out or he'll tell me what to do. All right, let's do this. Khalil now needs to hitch a trailer to the tug so the oil bucket can be towed away. I'll give him a wide berth there. Yeah? But he's not the best driver. A bit of banter eases the pressure, and it also helps the lads form close bonds. Good for watching each other's backs on the job. Oops. Oh. Initially, you think, oh, Sam's a tough guy. Like, you don't want to be on the wrong side of him. And then when you get to know him, then you know he's, he's just like the rest of us. This is the worst bit, turning him. Under Sam's trusty tutelage, Khalil is really learning his trade. He messes around. He has a bit of a laugh. It's all hard work with a daily dose of humour. Sorted. Got it where I wanted to be. <laughs> That'll do. With the engines drained of their oil, the lads are geared up for their removal. Each one of these magnificent beasts is handmade, with over 5,000 sweat and toil man hours put in to make each of them. They have a resale value of over $6 million a piece, and removing them is a nerve wracking precision job. Probably the worst part of turning an engine off is actually the low in, low in of the engine. Getting it all set up and disconnecting it's no problem at all. When you're lowering it, you've got to be, you have eyes all around, make sure you haven't missed, missed a stupid pipe or a, a plug or something. So, yeah, it can be a bit nervy to start with. These big, beautiful babies have their own specially engineered cradles made for them, so they can be locked in safely for transportation. With the stands manoeuvred into place, the removal of the cradles is an exacting job. One false move could lead to an extremely costly mistake. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Stop at the back. Get a... Hold on a minute. Let's get the front stand first. Uh, well, I. I couldn't quote you what the bill would be. I mean, if you drop an engine, God forbid, it would be a lot of money if you dropped one. A lot, a lot of money. It could be, more, it could be, it could be the finish of the company. I don't think they sure it's a cover of that sort of price. Get your bubble settled first before you start loading it. OK, can we have some quiet, please? Right, front winches only. Give two clicks each. Sometimes there's too much talking going on here. You tend to find a lot of the time doing these, you get too many people shouting out. If we're lowering an engine, it should be one voice, one voice heard giving instructions when we're lowering. If there's a problem, then there's a shout of stop or wait or what have you. Two more clicks. But uh, if you get too many people shouting out and out, it gets confusing. No, it's just one voice is heard. With concentration at the max, the moment of truth arrives as the engine begins disengaging from the aircraft. And the teamwork pays off as the multi-million dollar baby is successfully lowered into her cradle. The engines are the first part of a plane that can be reused, and despite the aviation industry having a reputation for being one of the most unenvironmentally friendly in the world, it may come as a surprise to learn just how much of an old aeroplane has an afterlife. We quite confidently say that 90% plus of the uh, weight of the aircraft that arrives at our facility is either reused or recycled. So I think uh, certainly from that statistic, uh, you would say that we actually have a, a good environmental performance. What we guarantee to our customers is that with a narrow-bodied aircraft, like the one be uh, just across the way there, um, it will be um, completely disassembled, with a full manifest of data of part numbers and serial numbers, completely packaged, ready for loading on trucks in no more than five weeks. And that's exactly what happened to the Airbus's engines. They passed their rigorous tests with flying colours and were both purchased by their new owner for a mighty total of $12 million. <laughs> Whilst the engines themselves may have gone on to fly another day, other parts of a stripped-down plane can go on to have some very surprising new uses of their own. All it takes is a bit of imagination and design flair, and parts of an aircraft can turn up where you'd least expect them, including in your living room. Uh, my name's Ben Tucker. I'm the founder, co-founder of Plane Industries. Well, there's some windows 
we've got in here. And we turn old aircraft parts into kind of high-end luxury furniture. Ben doesn't see old aircraft, just endless creative opportunities. We turn uh, old jumbo jet wheels into coffee tables. We've done everything from conference tables down to cufflinks from bolts. So we've kind of used lots of different parts of planes to make a number of different products. There's a ceiling panels they were using and put lights in the where the windows would be. Yeah. Andrew is E-Cube's head of customer services and one of his roles is to find new and innovative ways to recycle parts of the plane that were otherwise destined for the crusher. Ben typically uses the materials that nobody else has interest in. It is nice to see the, the rest of the fuselage used for something rather than just being smashed up into tin cans. So they're the Boeing windows. Yes. Today, Ben is on the hunt for various pieces of plane parts to turn into his fantastic bespoke furnishings. He never knows what he's going to find at E-Cube. It's like an Aladdin's cave for any would-be designer. This part of the business is a growing part of the business because we never used to do a va of very much of it whatsoever. But as we get more and more aircraft and we've got all these hulls sat here doing nothing, It'd be silly not to try and maximise what you can get back out of it and try and recycle even more of it. It's really good fun to come up here, and I mean, there's a lot of planes up here at the moment, so, you know, it's kind of eyes are wandering all the time. It's always interesting to come and see, because no matter how many times you've been here, these things, when they're in the flesh, are still pretty overwhelming. We'll send them down. Yeah, it wouldn't be too much, would it? No, possibly. I found what I was looking for today. Um, there's this kind of copious amount up here to choose from, which is really good. Um, bit of a struggle to get it all in the van, but once back at the workshop, we'll unload them um, and we'll be starting on them next week. Amongst his haul today is something from the Airbus that caught Ben's eye. Find out later what he intends to work wonders on. As the sun rises over the yard, the lads get ready to tear down the Airbus that came in from the Middle East. But first, they have a ruddy problem to attend to. So this Airbus has had its uh, engines removed, um, ready for the teardown. Uh, but in order to start the teardown, we need to um, take the rudder off and cut the fin in order to make it the right size to fit in the hangar. All of the commercial airliners that come through the base are too tall for the hangars, which were built before the Second World War. To get the planes through the hangar doors, the lads have to remove their tail rudders first. Now, that means working at a fair old height, around 40 feet off the ground, to reach the Airbus's tail fin. On hand to do the heavy lifting is a telescopic crane. How the boys love their big toys. And with a boom length of 60 metres, this one's got plenty of stretch for the job in hand. Overseeing this delicate operation today is Mac, who's pulled rank on senior technician Shippy. So we'll be going up, attaching a crane to the rudder, and then taking it off, basically. It's all prepped, ready to go. It's just a matter of move, removing the bolts, and uh, it should come off nice, hopefully. Fingers crossed. Shippy, despite being an engineer with over 30 years' experience on the clock, is a novice when it comes to this part of the job, which goes to prove there's always something new to learn in the plane reclaiming trade. Max, brilliant. Yeah, he's, 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 he's got the hang of it. He's done a few of them. He's a good laugh. I like the guy. So it's, uh, and, th and that's half the battle. If you can work with somebody and get on with them, it's, 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 it's cool. Mac, on the other hand, despite his relative youth, is a veteran of dozens of rudder removals and is relishing the chance of putting Shippy through his paces. Nick hasn't done many rudders before, maybe one or two. So today, because I've done more, I'm going to shadow him. Just keep an eye so he can do it himself. But the weather is trying to throw a spanner in the works, and all eyes are on the windsock. Weather conditions have to be very still for this operation. With the wind not easing, a rethink is required, and the crane is repositioned to a more protected spot. The thing about flying controls is they're designed to catch the wind. So if there's any wind about, it'll, it'll catch it, because they're basically metal sails. The cherry picker is called in for support to help stabilise the manoeuvre. But young Mac doesn't want to surrender total control to Shippy. Sorry. I was falling over. Go on, hang on. Oh, I won't touch that. I was driving in there. Oh, I won't touch that. I was driving in there. With the wind speed rising, it's imperative they get the operation completed as quickly and safely as possible. Strict orders. They want it off by 12. Yeah. Yeah, everything. 
main reasons why we use a cherry vicar is because that it's a small bucket. It goes above the crown of the aircraft without touching it. And it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's the only bit of kit you can use. So it's always a little bit trepidatious. And then as soon as it goes, and it's like a big sigh of relief. Once it releases itself and goes away from the aircraft, then you can start breathing again, man. <laughs> Taking advantage of the wind easing up, Shippy and Mac move quickly to remove the holding bolts that keep the rudder in place. All yours, MD! Didn't go too bad, actually. It went right. No accidents, no damages. So I'm happy. My apprentice done well. Yeah. He's out of work now. <laughs> With the rudder removed, the Airbus can now be moved into the hangar. Most of the planes that come to E-Cube at the end of their working lives are commercial aircraft, but occasionally they get a very special guest, just like this magnificent RAF Hercules that has served in every conflict since the first Gulf War in 1990. We've got XV-200, which is one of the uh, last Hercules Kate series aircraft the Air Force had. It's been parted out now, everything's been harvested off it. We've also um, helped out the museum at Boscombe Down. They've had various bits and pieces of it. And unfortunately, this afternoon, it's going to be its final day here. The smash-up people are here to um, smash it up. As I came through here, it was very nostalgic and also, for me, quite sad as well. So it was the first aircraft I ever worked on as a young 18-year-old. As the plane sits in the scrapyard, a band of brothers set about stripping out the final serviceable components and high-value metals, such as tungsten and copper, to be found wired throughout the aircraft. But as this loyal servant to the forces is about to be laid to rest, Bob isn't the only one looking to pay his last respects. We've got the next Air Force pilot coming in today who's had a long association with the Hercules aircraft. In fact, he's flown this particular one on numerous occasions. So he's popping across to have a look before it um, disappears. Flying high in the skies en route to the base is a former Royal Air Force Captain Roger Milburn. Travelling from his home in Wiltshire, Roger is a veteran of conflicts dating back to the Falklands War in 1982. He may have retired from the Air Force, but he'll always keep his wings. I don't know why, but I still like getting airborne. Uh, I'm privileged to be able to fly. I've got my waypoint coming up, which is the Southern Bridge, so that's uh, good news. Ex-RAF engineer Bob is on hand to give Roger a warm welcome. And it turns out they really are comrades in arms. Hi, Roger. I'm Bob Hayden, oh. the operations Hello, manager Bob. here. Roger Bilbo. Nice to meet you, sir. Hi. How do you do? <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah, no problem. Um, um, say, I'm ex-Hercules myself, the ground crew. Oh, right, OK. Yeah, well, when was, when was that? 1978. Then? That's OK. I, I first <laughs> started in 74. Oh, there we are. An RAF pilot has total respect for his ground crew because, um, you know, he, he trusts them, uh, we trust them. Go and have a, have a look and reintroduce you to her. Well, I would like to see her for one last time. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. The last thing you want yeah. to see is it being broken up. Yeah. They, no, I know, they I feel the same. The yeah. 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 Oh, dear. That has been ripped off, hasn't it? Yeah. But those, those radomers gone, but I see it's what's left of the uh, ECM, the Durkham kit. Of course, yeah. the undercarriage is gone there, yeah. the base. Uh, one of those things that I used to have to walk under <laughs> while I was flying. Have a look yeah. inside there. I see that the flares are still there. Yeah. <laughs> we used those in anger a couple of times in Iraq, I have to oh, say. Yeah. Yeah. The flare guns that were once mounted on the plane were part of the Hercules famed armoury design. They'd fire flares that would act as decoys to send heat-seeking missiles off course from their target. Yeah, I bet you've had some interesting um, things in this airframe. Well, this particular one, I first flew it on training in 74 okay. as a young co-pilot. 
then I did some short routes. I've been into Northern Ireland with it and uh, Germany. After the Falklands War, I flew down as the captain all the way down to Mount Pleasant, okay. which included air tanking yeah. using right, yeah. that probe. In my logbook, I've got 12 hours and 15 that take off to landing right. from Ascension Island down to Mount All the way Pleasant. Down. Okay, Roger, should we go inside yeah, and have a look around? As Roger and Bob head inside the aircraft for one final nostalgic tour, the Hercules is now only hours away from being sent to the scrapper. Back over in the main hangar, the Airbus A319 is now ready for the task of stripping out many of the valuable and reusable components that can be sold on and refurbished. But the original architects of the structure could not have predicted its current use. When this hangar was originally built in 1938, the largest aircraft that the architects of the time could envisage was the wartime bombers that were to come. I've been told that the door width of this particular hangar design uh, was the design criteria for the wingspan of the Lancaster. So in this hangar, the aircraft is positioned, one in the north bay, one in the south. Um, components are removed um, by the technicians. Uh, as they remove them, they write a handwritten tag, attach that to the component, and the components are placed on trolleys and taken to a, an area for processing where they'll be logged in and photographed um, and uh, uh, put through a packaging process. The A319 is next in line for stripping and Shippy and the gang are raring to go. Now's the time to get our hands dirty, crack on, and then just enjoy the teardown. We've took one air conditioning unit out. Dave now will carry on and do this side of the air conditioning unit. The aluminiums, the steels, the wiring, it's all recycled. The undercarriage doors here, we'll get these off. It'll just be a matter of knocking the pins out and dropping them on, on the pallets carefully. <laughs> we usually take about 12 to 1300 parts off an aircraft. While some parts are stripped to order, the majority are sent to the warehouse, where they're distributed to manufacturers across the world who refurbish them for other aeroplanes. Whatever the customer wants, we'll take off. A part that one customer wanted off the Airbus wasn't for use on another aeroplane. It was to turn into a piece of bespoke furniture. So which part of the plane captured Designer Ben's imagination? This itself is the, the, the front kind of um, intake from the engine. Um, you know, these pieces, have, uh, we find them absolutely fascinating because they've had tens of millions of pounds of development put into them on the, on the research and development side of things and the engineering side. Um, so we're working with an amazingly organic looking shape to begin with which from a design perspective is, is really fun because you're kind of, even though you're limited and you have those constraints, you have like a really beautiful um, piece of engineering to work with from the offset. And whether you're an aviation enthusiast or not, to look at these in their fully polished form um, is a really beautiful thing. We only ever design things that uh, we know we can get a number of units over the years. So that's where companies like eCube come in once they have been designated as a scrap effectively, which in the aircraft world is, is um, unserviceable, that's where we come in. Um, if these things can be reused and they have a value on the second-hand market, we can't get our hands on them because of the sheer cost involved of purchasing them. This particular piece is being delivered to a customer who's got his lounge, so I would imagine that, you know, it would be kind of like a, um, a real kind of like escape pod. So once you're in and you're comfortable, um, you're not going to be going anywhere anytime soon. And, and yeah, it's kind of you can just escape away from the world, I guess. And at a cost of $17,000, it's relaxation that comes with a hefty price tag. But Ben can't keep up with demand for his products and sees new ideas at every turn. I first took inspiration to turn into a chair when um, I actually saw I had one of these cowlings in the upright position in, in this position and um, my dad jumped into it and I kind of thought that's the natural position it wants to be in anyway and it would 
you know, make for an amazing, <laughs> amazing chair, or bite a bit of a kind of wacky one, if you would. This is the biggest chair we make, and I think this is be the biggest chair we ever make. I don't really think you can go any bigger than a chair. <laughs> Back over in the hangar, the strip down and take out of the Airbus is in full swing, and a special request has come in for one of the windows. Technical crew Di and Tim are on hand to carry out the task. And would you agree the primary function of this window, sliding window, is for the pilot and his crew possibly to egress the cabin? That's one reason. Um... The other reason is so they can get their green shield stamps and they can pay for the petrol when they, uh, just before oh, they take off. Oh, I wasn't off. aware of that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tim and Di are one of the longest-serving members of EQ and are a very well-oiled double act. There needs to be a partnership. There needs to be teamwork. The whole organisation is based on teamwork. When but as start? individuals, I think we have, although I hate to admit it, uh, respect for my senior colleague, senior in, in terms of miles on the clock. We can put the rope on that before we actually drop it out. What um, knot are you going to use here, Tim? I'm going to use a clove hitch. A what? A clove hitch with two hitches. His specialty is more in the electrical side of the aircraft, whereas mine is on the rigging side, and the term rigger uh, emanates from when we were seafarers and of course now this is a ship of the sky so the term and riggers used to rig the, the sheets i.e the ropes on on the ship am i right tim have you heard that expression no i haven't i think you're talking a lot of <laughs> how are these clove hitches looking uh, can i just done. eyeball them yeah of course yeah oh. I've never seen a clove hitch like that. Before. No, in the airport. Taking a plane apart is a truly hands on job and literally requires a team of technicians who know the ropes. Because, as in this case, those very ropes are being used to secure the window so that it can be hoisted out and lowered carefully onto a pallet. Yes, I will. OK, are we ready? Yep. I've got a little weight here, not a lot. Yep. You got it? I have it, I believe, yes. If these two hitches hold, we should be fine. Hey, that's a perfect knot there. Oh, OK. You ready? ready? After trying to tie each other in knots with their humour, it's time to see if Tim's rope trick is enough to do the job. Although the technique may look a little ad hoc, the end game is a successful removal of the windscreen. And uh, Sliding window. Sliding window. I stand corrected. Thank you, Tim. You're welcome. OK, thank you. Give me five. Yeah, thank you. Oh, yeah. Wow. Rock on. This panel weighs almost 80 kilos, the weight of a well-built fellow. So Tim takes control now. Most of the graft has okay. been done. Tim will adopt the role of the senior manager in this part of the I'll be speaking to you later. Oh, I can't quite hear what he's saying, but I don't think it's very good. Right up. Come down today. Can we go back a little bit before I come up? Uh, come up a little more, please, Nick. Hold it there. You be okay. careful there, Di. Okay. I hate to see anything happen to you. I reckon it's Waldorf and Statler up there, I do. Can I help in any way, Di? They're characters uh, yes. from The Muppet Show, yes. in case you're wondering. Uh, but I must applaud my colleague here. Not only made the task um, safer, but also the productivity improved. And of course, the likelihood of damage greatly re reduced. So I, th I think you deserve a very, well. Thank I, you, I don't know what sorry, to Sorry, my mouth's gone all dry. Oh, so is mine, I'm really quite embarrassed. Oh. Thank you, David. I really didn't know you cared. With the window removed, it's passed on to Shippy, who will see that it's packaged up and shipped out to a waiting customer. And that single window is worth over $6,000. So perhaps the lads' humour was disguising their nerves in case they dropped it. Nobody got hurt and nothing got damaged. So, good job then. Yeah. <laughs> Stupid idea.
Back out in the scrapyard, the RAF Hercules has long made her final flight and now awaits a great finale. Bob is showing Captain Roger Milburn around, the former captain of the Hercules on many sorties. OK, Roger, I'll let you go first. OK, back to the Thank office. Thank you very much. <laughs> Oh, I see the top bunk's off. <laughs> yeah, the old bunk. Yeah, yeah that's, the, that's the top bunk. <laughs> well, she's still got a distinctive smell. Yes, uh, well, the smell is... The smell um, of her yeah, keys, you, yeah. yeah, that's right. Always the same. <laughs> They're wonderful bits of kit. And I've got just so many fond memories of them. The Hercules is one of the most reliable aircraft of all time. And every pilot has a story about how the plane saw them through tough times. After the Falklands War, Bob, of course, yeah. we had we started the air bridge up. Yeah. And when I flew this one down here, we went to Mount Pleasant. We had uh, a classic. I'm going up, I'm about 18,000 feet in the climb, and my engineer just taps me on the shoulder. He said, I don't want to worry you, Captain, but um, you see number, I think it was number two engine. And as we went in and out of cloud, the temperature went up and down and up. And I went, oh, that's not very good. So we did a couple of checks on it, and eventually we thought, I think we'll shut this thing down. I think we're going to have to go home. Now, we had a tanker full of fuel ahead of us. We were full of fuel. We had to go back to Ascension. Both of us had to dump. I think he dumped about 25,000, and I must have dumped 20,000 pounds of fuel. Both of us had to turn around and come back cool. and get this engine fixed. As he looks round the gutted plane, Roger spots something that would make a treasured memento. The captain here would, would like this panel here. Yeah. And it's just, this. yeah, it's just, well, that, that, that get it frame, out, if you possible. like. Because yeah. that's, that's all the stuff from either side that I would be using. Yeah. As, yeah. as a, an instructor, I would be flying from either seat. I can't see a problem. No. That would be lovely. Yeah. Well, I suppose it's time to say goodbye to the old girl. XV200, bless you. You've been a, a great pal to me, and I've flown 125 hours in you, and uh, I wish you all the best in the big sky that you're going to. Yeah, it was a sad day, you know, because, I say, I joined the Air Force in 1978. They were the first aircraft I worked on, and it was actually those particular aircraft. I can remember me as a little 17 and a half, 18-year-old kid, you know, working on them, and see them just smashed up by a um, digger is not very nice. There's the wing going. You can still see the roundel. A bit like a dinosaur. Very sad to see. In a way, it just shows you that the aeroplane's kind of had its life. Getting a bit, bit old, a bit brittle. It's like looking in somebody's body, you know? She's uh, not a live thing, but she's not far off. They, they've got, they have soul, or they used to have soul, let's say. Now it's just bits of metal, I'm afraid. Anyway, that's enough. The Hercules was the first plane on the list for scrapping today. But now it's time to move on to the big boys of aviation, the commercial airliners. Perry and Chicken are the scrapyard chiefs and are on site to see the final disposal of the fuselages is a smooth operation. The yard is full up. All, all these are ready to go now. Everything's been signed off. So we're going to have the demolition boys are going to be coming in and they're going to start smashing them up. Perry is a plane lover, but scrapping partner Chicken, not so. I've never had a love of aircraft. I've always enjoyed fixing them, and I've always enjoyed working on them, but they've never interested me. If I see one in the sky, I have no interest of, of what it is. Uh, I never have, and I, I never will. I know how to cut it up, and I know how to fix it, and that's all that bothers me. One big pile and then get rid of all the scrap. I just cut them up and smash them up. 
I'm just a hairy ass welder. <laughs> The empty shells of the fuselages are torn to pieces by the T-Rex-like jaws of the monster-sized wrecking machines. The time has come to move onto the Airbus, but just as the scrap lads are about to get started... Good morning, you keep solutions. Andrew speaking. Andrew takes a very interesting call. Yes, we do. So that was a TV production company looking to buy um, an A320 fuselage section to make a a new series. You won't tell me what series, but uh, it's a new TV series that they need a, nearly a whole aircraft for. But it's uh, always exciting to do film work and see these things on TV. We've cut them up, we've sent them off, and then what they can do with them then the other end when they set them on fire and plume smoke out of them and all that kind of stuff is quite interesting. So. They plan to uh, like fluff the edges a bit to make it look uh, not so clean, really, to uh, sort of mimic a plane crash. All the bits are in there that we're for the cut line. This cut line where we stripped it, all the bits are in there, so they're going to be rebuilding it all back together. It won't be recognisable once it's on film with all the effects and all the other bits and bobs they're going to be doing. It's nice to know that something will be put on screen that we've cut up and we can say, yeah, I don't know. The fuselage of the plane has had to be cut into two sections, in theory, to make it more manageable for shipping. The trailer just, uh, just to the side of me has uh, turned up now. Um, he's planned to load both fuselage sections on, on a one low loader, which is going to be uh, a bit of a sight to see, really. I think the, uh, them combined are about 18 metres long each, uh, five metres wide, so it's quite uh, an obscure load. The transportation boys have their massive tape measures out. And they need them because this is a precision job. The measurements need to be spot on. Just a few centimetres out could mean the plane won't fit on the lorry bed. We've got two sections we have. This is the middle section, the one with the wings on it. Yeah, the wings have got to go as well with it, as well, the wings we've cut off. A further complication comes in the form of the weight of the load being dangerously close to the crane's capacity. I estimated this weighs about seven ton, no, eight ton, and he said he's good to maybe lift that. So, uh, we'll see. <laughs> Of course, now there's the trusty Welsh weather to contend with. The wind has uh, classically again decided to pick up when we want to do a load. It's a nice day for it, especially when you're standing you're on the end of a rope. You don't want the, uh, the rain coming down. I'm on this rope, only just to uh, guide it in, I'm not doing anything really. Well, they're trying to move the beds to locate them to the position to drop it down so it'll be on a free space. There's locators, yeah. that's where they're strapping it, and it's just wedged in, it's just a tight fit. That's good. That's, that's good. Oh, nice. I think I think the boys are happy. They wanted to move it forward a little bit, but I think they're happy. Looks lovely. With one section on board, it's on to the next, but the wind is picking up, causing strain on the cables as the lads try to steady the fuselage. Lovely there. But despite the best efforts of the wind to sway the heavy load, the teamwork pays off with the fuselage safely landed onto the transporter bed. Job done. Having escaped the jaws of the crusher, the fuselage of the Airbus heads off on a low loader for a new life in the limelight.